Okay, let's get started. Welcome to HEO Colloquium today. Uh, today we're very happy to have the Dr. Uh, uh, Eric Sutton here uh, from AFRL. <coughs> so Eric uh, received his uh, PhD in Aerospace Engineering Sciences from CU. Uh, currently he's a research physicist in the ionospheric hazards specification and forecast section of uh, AFRL, uh, specializing in upper atmospheric and uh, ionospheric modeling and data analysis. Uh, in the past six years with the uh, FRL, uh, his research has focused on the modeling the, um, of the upper atmosphere and ionosphere, emphasizing on the improvements to satellite drag forecasting capabilities. Uh, he's also known for producing the global data sets of uh, uh, thermosphere density from CHAMP and GRACE, uh, very widely used. And, uh, and also applying this to the characterization of upper atmosphere response to solar and uh, geomagnetic disturbances. Uh, today he's going to discuss uh, helium. Thank you very much, Han Lee. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. I'm also going to turn this microphone on as well so I can wander. Um, and let's see, how's that? <laughs> Perfect. Um, so thank you, uh, Hanley, and, and also thank you to the search committee for having me in here to talk about uh, this work that I've been doing over the past uh, several years, um, which is basically, has basically involved um, um, putting uh, neutral helium into the Thai GCM model. Um, and, and today I'll, I'll just go over um, you know, some, of the, some of the background, uh, or basically the background and motivation um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how this model development has progressed. Um, and, uh, and I also want to show kind of some of the outputs of, of the model, um, some of the salient uh, features um, and response characteristics. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, transport mechanisms to finish it off. Um, so first, just to give everybody kind of a, a good overall picture of helium's effect on uh, mass density in, in the thermosphere and, and more importantly, in the uh, lower exosphere. Um, I, I want to draw your attention to this vertical profile over here on the left side. Um, now this, goes, this uh, goes from the bottom here at about 100 kilometers all the way to the top at about 1,000 kilometers. Um, somewhere in here is, is the, is the uh, lower level, the Thai GCM model. Somewhere kind of in this general vicinity is the, is the upper boundary of the model. And what I've done above, above that upper boundary is um, to use a simple extrapolation model, um, which assumes diffusive equilibrium. Um, but as on the, on the right side here, um, you see a, a horizontal map uh, corresponding to this 100 kilometer level. Um, and you see a lot of kind of semidurnal tidal uh, structures here, uh, as you would expect. Um, but as I go through here, as I sweep upward um, through the thermosphere and into the exosphere, um, you see the mass densities over here changing dramatically. Um, and, and by the time you get into the lower exosphere, uh, the mass, this white mass density curve is completely dominated by, by uh, the helium uh, line right here, which is in green or cyan. Um, so, so here's a very temperature dependent distribution and it turns into atom atomic oxygen dominated and then that gives way to, to uh, helium uh, up above in, in the lower exosphere. Um, and, and this is, I should mention, this is a plot during solstice. So, so you see, um, you see that you see a um, basically the seasonal distribution being uh, strongly driven um, uh, up in these up in these altitudes by neutral helium. And I'll explain why helium uh, has such a strong preference for the winter hemisphere, um, and why it also has a strong preference for early local times, uh, early kind of morning local times. You don't see a lot of that here, um, but you see a lot of that during equinox. Now, before I move on, I'll mention that, um, of course, this is what control, up here, uh, helium is important for the mass density, um, but a lot of the dynamics that are controlling it are, are operating down here. Uh, molecular diffusion, eddy diffusion, uh, circulation, these are all 
determining the gradients in here, which then lead to this more linear, in, in, on the log scale, uh, more linear um, profile up above. So. Um, so if we go back um, about a century, um, uh, Chapman, Sidney Chapman was one of the first to, um, to really ex explain the effects of uh, molecular diffusion on the upper atmosphere. And this is a very old plot, but, and of course there, there are some things which are, that, that are, um, well, they're 100 years old. <laughs> so they're not quite right. Um, but, but he is, if, if uh, you assume that there is some height at, at which molecular diffusion begins to dominate, um, things change a little bit from, from the lower mixed atmosphere. Now this, this line should probably be, instead of a 20 kilometers, it should probably be somewhere closer to 100 kilometers. Um, there's also, you might notice, there's also no mention of atomic oxygen in here because they, we didn't have that basic physical understanding. Um, but, but what they did capture was that uh, this nitrogen, or, or um, yeah, this nitrogen uh, um, distribution would, would soon give way to a lighter species, uh, helium, um, if, if you go up far enough. And so notionally, um, this, is, this is very um, um, accurate in, in terms of quantitatively, not so much. But uh, it took another 40 or so years to um, to actually have some good observational data that, that could back this up. And by this time, this is into the space age, we've launched rockets, we've, we've launched other satellites. Um, this just happened to be a very, very, very large satellite, about 100 feet in diameter, um, that was launched into the lower exosphere at about uh, 1,500 kilometers. Um, and and uh, although not the primary mission of the satellite, um, what they were able to infer from, from having such a large light object in the exosphere was, was that the, the composition was not understood well. Um, and it does not simply follow diffusive equilibrium all the way from the turbopause upward into the lower exosphere. Um, and and uh, Nicolay ascribed the motion that they saw with the satellite Echo 1 uh, to the abundance of helium there. Um, several years later, we start launching mass spectrometers into the upper atmosphere, into, the, into orbit. Um, this is a very early uh, instrument, uh, double deflection magnetic mass spectrometer, um, basically an open source device, ionizes almost external to the vehicle. Um, this is on Explorer 17. Um, and with that, we were able to build up a slightly better picture of, of what helium was doing in the atmosphere. And, and with that came this notion that there's a strong seasonal latitude variation that, that is, not, um, is not related to just the normal um, assumptions of, of uh, diffusive equilibrium. Um, uh, several years later, we have launched more satellites up. We've, we've got a better coverage um, and we're able to infer uh, with a little bit more certainty, some of the seasonal variations that are that are inferred from drag, but but um, they, they were able to say that uh, there's actually a winter to summer helium concentration ratio of about 2.5 from this data, and and that's that's sort of um, um, not what was expected um, because you would expect if, if if diffusive equilibrium plays out at all heights. Um, you would expect your composition to follow your maximum in temperature. So you would expect something in the summer hemisphere. Uh, you would expect more, uh, more species density in, in the summer hemisphere than you would in the winter hemisphere. So, so they're finding this, and this is exactly the opposite of what they were expecting. Um, fast forward a couple more years, and, and we have some really conclusive mass spectrometer measurements that are, that are actually saying that, that this ratio is more like a factor of 10. Uh, this is a, a um, just ratio of, of helium measurements using, using uh, this mass spectrometer. Um, ratio of that to what you would expect from a diffusive equilibrium um, extrapolation from, from lower atmosphere. So, and that during this time period, uh, it was in southern hemispheric winter. This is June. Um, you can see about an order of magnitude between these two um, extrema. Um, and, then, and then over the next uh, decade, decade and a half, 
Um, we had some really wonderful measurements, uh, Atmospheric Explorer, C, D, and E, uh, San Marco 3, Estro 4, uh, Dynamics Explorer 2, that really built a great global picture of, of this phenomenon. And this is a, a, a global map um, uh, from KG and Kerr in, in the mid 80s, uh, and all of this is from AED data. So um, again, this kind of confirms, you know, at about 300 kilometers or so, there's an order of magnitude difference from um, these, between the summer and the winter hemisphere. So I'll, I'll go into some of these um, features in, in just a bit. Um, but first, let me talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the drivers of, of this current work. Um, so fast forward, you know, 40 or so years to, to today, um, we have launched a whole lot of satellites into low Earth orbit. Um, they actually tend to concentrate around uh, 800 or 850 kilometers in terms of um, the perigee of, of satellites and, and the density there. Um, uh, that, that's due to a number of reasons, but um, uh, we, we, when we talk about satellite drag, we, we really focus on this region quite a bit. Um, and, and not a whole lot of, of uh, attention has been paid to this region in terms of modeling. Um, so, so this work, um, to, have a, to um, have a modeling capability that could be extended up into this region was, was kind of a driving force here. Um, this, this upper, basically the high altitude or upper register of LEO is what I would call it. Um, and of, of course, as you move upward here, the density is decreasing exponentially, nearly exponentially. Um, so there's kind of a sweet spot here where you, where you really need to know density and be able to forecast it very well. Um, and the, the other part of that is, is um, you know, driven by the crowdedness. So um, a, lot of the, a lot of the operational assets are, are also right here. So, so when you're doing collision avoidance and collision assessment, um, that's where you need your density model to work very well. Um, so uh, just to give you um, an idea of, of the current empirical models that, that could be used for uh, in this height regime, um, the IMSIS model here shown for uh, solstice, northern hemispheric winter, and, and equinox um, do have a pretty good uh, climatological averaged um, understanding of, of composition, including, uh, including helium. So, um, so here you see uh, this winter accumulation. This, is, this has been called the winter helium bulge since basically back in the 70s. Um, during equinox, I mentioned the uh, early local time structure. So that's, that's encapsulated there, but, um, but also it's, it's, it's kind of a function of um, the available data, the sparseness of the data from those mi uh, missions back in the 70s and 80s, um, and, and convolve that with the basis functions, the fairly coarse basis functions here. So, um, so it has an understanding of, of composition, which is great. Um, one of the models that's actually used quite a bit for um, operational satellite drag and orbit prediction is this uh, Yakia Bowman 08 model. Um, and, and here you can see th these are uh, helium mass densities. I forgot to mention that. Um, and uh, these plots share a common scale, and, and as do these two plots as well. Um, and you can see what I might, what I refer to as kind of the um, um, kind of the, the dynamic range or the, or the color space that's taken up by, by these variations is very small compared to what MSIS sees. Um, another issue is that, um, is that the maxima, which you can barely make out here, but the maxima in, in both of these plots are really centered around um, the temperature distribution. They're, they're basically subsolar. Um, so temperature would be very warm in here and very warm in here, um, but that's not necessarily what the composition follows. So, um, so uh, let's see. So our, our model development work was aimed at having a physical capability to model neutral helium um, that could potentially feed into a more um, applications-driven scenario. Um, so I'll talk just, just briefly um, about our model development and, and, and some of our initial validation. 
Um, so this is a very scary slide. I apologize for the equations, but um, but it does kind of illustrate um, the, what you're solving here. A, a um, diffusion equation, in other words, a uh, conservation of momentum equation, and a continuity or conservation of mass equation. Um, you combine these two, and these are uh, well. You combine these two, and you get what what we refer to as the major, major species composition equation. Um, and this is cast in terms of uh, mass fraction or mass mixing ratio, and it's also made uh, much more unapproachable by the fact that it is in um, uh, cast in log pressure coordinates um, that leading to some strange uh, exponential terms, pressure terms basically. Um, but, but you can see that, that uh, time rate of change of, of your mass fraction of, of whichever species you're, you're interested in um, has to do with the uh, molecular diffusive flow, an eddy diffusive flow, um, horizontal advection and vertical advection, and uh, in the case of helium, uh, we we so far we have not modeled any chemical um, reactions, so that, that this chemical source term is effectively zero. But, uh, one of the other things that that we had to uh, account for, uh, because helium is such a uh, low mass species compared to the um, mean mass of the atmosphere. Um, we have to account for um, its behavior in the lower exosphere, above the exobase, and, and in practice, above the upper boundary of the TIGCM model. And, and what, I, what ends up happening is, for instance, if you have this, um, this distribution of helium number density, this is, this is well below the uh, upper boundary, but this kind of maps up this uh, in a way. Um, but if you have this distribution during, say, winter time, where, where there's a lot of helium here, um, you will have uh, particles that are energetic enough to leave the model, traveling upward along ballistic trajectories, and then re-enter the model somewhere away from this um, main accumulation here. So, so having having this uh, mechanism in the model really changes the gradient that is supported right in here, um, so that. Um, so that if you want to talk about winter to summer, winter to summer uh, ratios, um, you really need to have a, a good uh, understanding of that transport because that is one of, one of several mechanisms that will control that in a way. So here's some initial validation uh, that we've done uh, with this model. I was working on this with a, a, a master's student who put all these charts, uh, put all these plots together. Um, it turns out there are not all that many data sources for comparison here, but uh, we were able to find about a handful of uh, basically calibration satellites, a lot of uh, sphere-shaped objects that are, in, that are in orbit between, say, five and uh, 500 and 1,000 kilometers. Um, and those were provided by uh, courtesy of Bruce Bowman. Uh, this, this is just a plot of one comparison over over a good fraction of, of the last solar cycle, um, and and what you see here, the yellow, the yellow line here is is the new TIGCM model with helium included. Uh, this cyan color is is without it included, and then the purple is the actual data that we compare to, um, and over over on average we're doing fairly well with the yellow line. You can see. Um, away from, away from uh, real strong solar maximum conditions, um, the, the original TIGC model really drops off, and it can be by an order of magnitude or more, which, which is very um, significant. Now, what we had to do here, um, because the TIGC model does not um, consistently make it up into the 500 to 1,000 kilometer range, we have had to um, apply a very simple um, extension model, and and so one of the things in the future to to look at is is you know is that accurate or do we need a more sophisticated way to to um, actually simulate the upper uh, the, lo the lower exosphere. Um, so yeah, we're we're doing pretty well here. There are some uh, variations here which we're actually still looking into. It, it that almost looks like an annual variation, but it's 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 actually more due to an aliasing of the satellite's orbit. Um, 
Um, so you might say, well, what, is, what does a, a um, order of magnitude difference between your models do in terms of orbit propagation? Does it have any effect, or, or can we just ignore that? And so to answer that question, I, I made a very simple um, kind of back of the envelope calculation using about 6,000, a little bit over 6,000 uh, LEO objects um, between 500 and 1,000 kilometer, kilometers. I propagated their orbits using a very simple technique and, and then switched the density model um, so that I could, I could propagate it again uh, without helium. So I used with, with helium and without helium. Um, and then I let that run for a few days uh, this is 24 hours, so this is this is basically an RMS of the of the difference between those two orbits over the time period. Um, so this is 72 hours, and this is 100 kilometers B mag, um, which is that RMS uh, quantity. Um, so so it is significant. Um, obviously, there's a caveat here in, in real time operations. Um, this doesn't. This is not exactly. Um, this scenario is not exactly an apples to apples comparison. Um, this, is, this is just on a log scale now um, after 72 hours. So here's the distribution of, of satellites at, after, after uh, running the two different ways. Um, in, in operations, you would estimate a ballistic coefficient, and that would adjust, basically soak up the air in your density model. So we're not running around with all of our satellites you know, hundreds of kilometers from where we think it is. This is more of just as a, of a sensitivity analysis, but um, it, it gives you kind of a first guess at, at uh, the difference that swapping in two models could, could, um, could, could cause. Um, so now I want to go through um, just some of the uh, basic characteristics of the model. Um, and I thought the easiest way to do that in this setting um, would be to run a series of um, simulations and then to um, to compile uh, several uh, animations um, so that we can see the motion as it's happening. So uh, this first one, uh, I want to I'm trying to separate the seasonal characteristics from any geomagnetic influences or, or etc. Um, and so I've run I've run the TIGCM model with constant geomagnetic forcing. Um, and I've also taken out um, the lower boundary tides. I've, I've really just tried to make this as, as smooth of a model run as I can. Um, and here's, here's what uh, results. Um, so this is a, a year-long simulation uh, and, uh, with KP set constant to uh, 1.3. Um, and, and what you can see is um, what's referred to as the winter helium bulge. You just saw it disappear there. Um, uh, migrate past the equator at early local times and then accumulate um, in this other winter hemisphere now. Um, and I've also shown what the MSIS model is telling us um, in a climatological sense. Um, so these are the seasonal characteristics that, that kind of dominate the helium distribution. Um, if I were to again run that for a very quiet year, say, say 2008, um, but no longer holding the geomagnetic um, inputs constant, I'd see a, a very different uh, picture, and I'd see this, in fact. And so you see that um, the distribution here is very sensitive to very, very small scale changes in geomagnetic activity. I mean, this is, this is 2008, so I think, you know, KP, if, if that's the indicator you, um, you would want to use, um, it, it rarely went over three and almost never went over four um, in, in, at those times. Um, but you can see these factor of two to four uh, depletions um, on a scale of, of you know, a day or, or so uh, that result from just that small scale geomagnetic activity. Um, so if we go back, um, if we go back to the constant forcing um, and we take a look at the winter hemisphere um, um, during, uh, during you know, basically uh, in the southern hemisphere uh, for, for June solstice conditions, uh, it looks something like this. So this is, this is um, in geographic coordinates, um, so that this is a little bit different than, than what you might be used to seeing. 
Um, but I keep it in, the, in that frame uh, so that you can really see the interaction um, of the heating source, which is, this is the, the height integrated joule heating um, uh, distribution. Um, and, and you can really see the interaction between, between this and the helium uh, accumulation in the wintertime. So it's kind of stirring it around the poles. Um, and this is obviously, again, this is very quiet um, and constant. Um, so you see as, as this moves around, it kind of, it, it has a small um, impact on the distribution in that it, it um, kind of changes its shape a little bit. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see a little bit more of that later, but, but it also just kind of stirs it around. And so if you're, if you're sitting here, if your satellite is, is sensing right here, um, you're going to see a diurnal variation um, from, from this helium distribution. Um, there's also some co-rotation effects that are, that are coupling in here as well. Um, so this is, this is a little bit more exciting now. I decided uh, for this talk to simulate a storm. I decided just to go with the AGU storm, uh, to December 2006. Um, and, and you'll see here, this is a similar plot to the, to the last one. I've, I've changed the uh, contour interval, interval considerably because now we're in storm time conditions. And, and so you'll see these contours pop up here and, and here um, and really change the, the heating, really input a lot of um, uh, heat and, and, and um, the effect of that on this, on this composition distribution is, is what I want to draw your attention to. This is just the KP index as we move forward in time um, as a kind of a broad indicator of what's going on. Uh, and, you, and you can see there are some fairly low activity periods for multiple hours here and, and there. Um, this is obviously the, the bulk of the storm there. Um, but, but as you go from here to here, um, watch carefully and you'll see um, the helium distribution kind of regroups, forms one, one mass um, near the North Pole. Um, and then when you, when you hit the next little spike, even, even though it may be only this, this large, it'll, it'll kind of scatter and deform quite a bit. So, so I'll kick this off. Um, Right about here is, is when KP goes way up, and you see this, this surge here um, all the way down to um, 20 degrees uh, latitude. Um, and then these, these uh, forms tend to kind of uh, 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 co-rotate a little bit. And then when it's very quiet, they're regrouping. Uh, basically, you're, you're looking at a lava lamp, more or less. Um, but um, one of the things I want to draw your attention to uh, when it pauses here again is the level of, so this is, this is almost a factor of 10 depletion compared to, to right over here. Um, so that's a, that's a huge difference. Um, the, the questions that arise in my mind are, well, what, what does that look like in the lower exosphere? How does that map? Does it just directly map in kind of a static sense? Um, is there some time delay? Um, how does that look in, in the plasma sphere? Um, and of course, we don't, we don't have those capabilities yet to, to map this directly to the plasma sphere yet. But um, I, I think you know, it, finding out the sensitivities there would be very interesting. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the transport mechanisms. Um, and so, so far I've, you know, I've given you, let me go back for a second, I've, I've given you kind of an overview of, of the model development work. Um, I've, I've touched on um, the behavior and response characteristics, um, but I haven't really said much about why this, this uh, winter helium uh, distribution is occurring or, or where does the sensitivity to geomagnetic activity um, come from. And so I want to say a little bit about that here. Um, and I kind of boiled this down to one question, which is, what causes the wintertime accumulation of helium? Um, and so a lot of, a lot of work was, was done on, on figuring this out back in the 70s. Um, there, were, there were actually two theories that came out there. Um, they kind of start off the same way here, that uh, first you need a diffusively separated atmosphere. 
and second you need a, a general summer hemisphere to winter hemisphere flow. Um, but this is where they kind of fork from each other. Um, uh, this work by Carl Reber and Paul Hayes um, cites uh, the vertical advection. And if you remember back to the slide with all the equations, that's one of those terms that, that uh, forces, um, forces uh, the, the time rate of change of the mass mixing ratio. Um, so they, they claim that, that uh, this is the main mechanism by which um, increases in the winter time hemisphere um, occur. Basically, if you have a, a summer to winter flow, uh, in, on average in the winter hemisphere, you're going to have um, horizontal convergence and downwelling. The downwelling is going to drive that advection term. And that is going to, the sign on the, of that is going to act to, to uh, accumulate helium. Um, on the other hand, there was a, uh, a different theory uh, put forth by Mayer and Volland. Uh, it shows um, their work was, uh, was uh, going on at the same time as this work, but this is actually a, a pretty good reference for, for uh, of review, basically. Um, but they, they claimed that also, due to this um, um, uh, summer to winter flow, um, there's an interhemispheric lateral transport that preferentially distributes helium from the summertime thermosphere, uh, th 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 some, excuse me, th summertime thermosphere to the wintertime thermosphere. Um, and and there, there's obviously a, a, as well a, a um, uh, in the in the lower thermosphere or even below that, there's a, a very weak return flow um, that that um, satisfies continuity on, in a global sense. Um, so, um, I guess the the kind of the fight there, the debate between these two theories has has come into focus a little bit more in the last um, three or four years um, due to a, a few papers. Um, and, and, and basically, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing here from, um, from what uh, is said in, in a review paper by John Emmer just, just this last year, um, that, that more or less this, this um, theory is, is kind of at odds with this theory. And, and the two, it's, it's one or the other, not both. Um, so I, I um, designed kind of a numerical experiment to, to Actually, let me go back for one second. Recently, it, it, uh, this theory over here has been getting um, a little bit more and more respect, I would say, um, and more attention. Um, and and this, this one over here, um, people have been kind of poking holes in it. Um, so I wanted to just kind of go back and, and um, kind of assess, you know, is there an interhemispheric flow? Is it, is it significant? Um, and can, we, can that tell us anything about, about this theory? So I designed this numerical experiment that, um, that, uh, that, that required um, a, a hemispheric mass conservation equation, which I have here. And basically, um, let's, just look, let's just look at the southern hemisphere. So this gray um, volume here. Um, within that gray volume, I can add up all of the helium within the model. Um, I can also look at the rate of change of helium within, within this control volume. Um, and the, the third thing that I can do is I can monitor any influx into that region. And I can, I can separate the influx into what's coming what's traveling horizontally across the equator. And I hope this schematic kind of makes sense to everybody. Um, um, and so, but I can separate the horizontal mass influx across the equator from what's coming in from above, this red gridded uh, sphere, and, and what's coming in from below, this uh, solid orb below. Um, so, so the rates here um, on this plot are green, that's for the horizontal, red, that's for the uh, vertical. Um, these are mass influxes into the control volume. And, and this is run for about a year under very, um, very constant conditions. I've tried to, to remove all, all effects other than just the seasonal change. Um, and, he, and here, this is uh, the fractional 
uh, helium content. So if there's X number of, of atoms in the thermosphere that are helium atoms, um, this fraction of them right here are in, the, are in the southern hemisphere, and this fraction are in the northern hemisphere at any given time during the year. So as I, as I go forward from, from equinox and all the way into June solstice, you see this buildup of helium um, in, the, in the winter hemisphere. Um, and, and you can see the sign of, of this rate term is feeding helium into the control volume by way of the equator. So, so we are seeing some kind of an interhemispheric lateral transport. Um, so, so there's something there that needs to be explored a little bit. Um, we also, at the same time, we can't um, dispel this theory because it, it's, it's very easy to prove. We can, we can do a term analysis on that composition equation and we can directly observe that, that this term is in fact causing the buildup locally of helium. So, um, so you know, what does all this mean? We have two theories and, and they're at odds with each other and they're both correct. Um, and, and what I would propose is that um, this kind of parenthetical um, caveat here, um, the, the fact that the horizontal wind convergence um, drives the vertical advection term, um, that this may be more directly related to the transport of, say, helium um, than we give it credit for. Um, but this is, so this is a little bit controversial and, and um, I, you know, I present it here to, to help people to poke holes in it because I think that's, <laughs> that's um, valuable. Um, but I'd, I'd like to, you know, talk more with anybody um, who falls on either side of this discussion, or, or maybe some, some people agree, but, but I think that'd be a very valuable, um, uh, very valuable conversation to, to keep going. So um, I think that's all I have to say. Um, just some concluding remarks here. Um, I've shown the, the development here. I've shown some of the features. Um, uh, we're doing some model data comparisons for validation. Um, and uh, certainly, we're, we're, I'm looking at the circulation diffusion interaction, and, and I'd like everybody's thoughts on that. If um, uh, I'd like to know what everybody thinks, um, you know, if if it turns out that, that there's something there in that in that theory, um, there's possible connections with with atomic oxygen, another light uh, species in the thermosphere, um, and and possibly owed into behavior. Um, I'm certainly interested in uh, in future model extensions. Um, whether it be uh, neutral or, or more ionospheric and plasmaspheric. So I'd be happy to talk with anybody about those, those developments. So early in your talk, you referred to the importance of the um, well, like ballistic uh, transport, uh -huh. ballistic trajectory transport of helium right. at very high altitudes. How does that relate to, uh, in, in the modeling you've been done, doing, how does that relate to the upper boundary condition uh, applied in the TIGCM? Do you have that's right? That, that, uh, yeah, that, that basically is the upper boundary condition. Let me, let me run back there real fast. Um, sorry to scroll through these so quick. Um, yes, yeah, so so there's an equation uh, of this form, it's a Laplacian, um, that, that stipulates what, what this flux is. If you have, um, basically it depends on the number density and, and temperature of, um, that's all hidden in these terms, but, um, but if, if you have a distribution of helium, uh, you can calculate uh, the flux. And that is, um, that is um, actually used as the upper boundary in this new model. Um, so that is, that is, that is um, input into TIGCM as a diffusive flux for, for kind of practical reasons. Um, most of the other species um, have a diffusive equilibrium upper boundary. Um, this adds this, the helium adds this term to that 
And that's been, we've had to play some tricks, numerical tricks, in order to actually get that to work and to not crash the model and, and, and not add um, uh, instability in, into the numerics. But, um, but I think we found a, a pretty good um, balance between computational efficiency and accuracy and, and the filtering and all of that. In your um, accounting for um, flux, uh, the fluxes, uh, is how much is transported into and out of the two hemispheres, is this flux included, or did you only include fluxes up to the upper boundary of the model? Um, in, in the later part, yes. Um, let's see. So this is a lateral transport term, and it is not, I think it is included as a vertical term. So it would be one of the red, that would be part of that red line. Um, I, yeah, that, that's true. It is kind of a lateral transport. Um, so maybe it should be shuffled to the other side. <laughs> Are uh, Grace and the uh, Champ too low to measure the diurnal effect at solstice? And sort of a parallel question at the higher altitudes, seven or eight hundred kilometers. If you have a GPS track satellite, can you see the diurnal effect? I don't know so that density change. Mm -hmm. That's the second question. That's a great question. Um, I I think there are. There are actually going to be some um, some accelerometer missions, um, and I'm drawing a blank on the name. But in the next few years, there's going to be an accelerometer around 850 kilometers. Um, so that might be worth looking at. Um, in terms of the GPS measurements, um, that would certainly help to cut down the um, the cadence or time resolution of your measurement. Um, right now, um, you have to use, uh, for instance, the, the sphere that I, I showed, um, the, the validation from earlier. Um, you have to use several days of data on, on that object. And it has to be a very large and very lightweight object um, to get the information that you need out of it. Um, so, so putting the GPS on, on an appropriately sized and weighted um, satellite would be I think very helpful to to get a, a higher resolution picture of what's going on there. And so, I'm sorry, I, di I didn't answer your first question though. Champ and Grace. Champ and Grace. Yeah, they're they're a little bit lower than this. Um, you might be able to get a little bit of a signal out of Grace during deep solar minimum. Um, and and we've looked at those. In fact, part of the validation work was with sampling those satellites. You certainly see very, very little from, from CHAMP. Um, you, you see a, a little, you know, few percent from GRACE. Um, it was probably around, I'm, I'm just guessing, it was probably around about 450 during 2008 or so when, when solar minimum was, was in effect. I'm just trying to understand your your numerical experiment to do the term analysis there. Sure. How sensitive to your detection of the the horizontal, um, the the second theory, the transport that has to go through the cyan cut, is it to where you place the altitude of that red sphere? Right. I mean, I'm presuming that red sphere is not the lower boundary of the of the Tai GCM, right? But you could have transport across the equator, completely inside the the red sphere that could end up further up at higher higher altitudes there that's how, very how do you how do you, that, how do you do that testing and evaluation yeah that's that's very true uh, it is somewhat sensitive to uh, sorry let me let me pull this up <laughs> okay um, so yes um, and yeah, we've, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, where do you put this lower boundary? Um, and what do you consider thermospheric transport or, or underneath that? Um, you know, um, and, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a gray area for me. I don't, you know, there's certainly if you, if you raise this, if you raise the lower boundary of, of for this equation, um, too far, 
you're going to be above a lot of the transport. Um, so this, this numerical experiment, um, I meant to mention this, but um, it, it really is best at seeing if there is an interhemispheric lateral transport. It's not so good at assessing what's going on within that control volume in terms of vertical flow. So yes, there are vertical flows um, within that control volume for sure. Really good. Uh, yes. So, the, so in general, you would want uh, these three to add up to each other, or, or this, this equality to be correct. Um, there's actually um, some numerical error, and basically some composition um, diffusion going on uh, in Tai GCM. Um, and, ha and how you get this is you, you calculate um, the rate, this rate, you can calculate this several ways from two different diagnostics within the um, within the model. You can sum up all of your, you can sum up all of these rate terms, and that's one way to calculate it. You can also sum up all of the helium, and then take the difference between time steps and get two ideas of of um, what the difference is. So one of the things I might mention though that is that this numerical term. Now, so basically though, if you add this gray, this red, and this uh, cyan color, you will get the, the white curve. Um, but the sign of this numerical curve is in opposition of the buildup of helium. Um, so in some ways, it is not the, the um, it's not what's causing the buildup. Red vertical curve is different in the two winters, right? I mean, it's 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 uh, ah yes. If you're zero in in uh, northern hemisphere winter, and mm -hmm. large during uh, yeah. So this these these rates. Yeah, these rates are, are um, influx into the southern hemisphere. Um, if I were to plot out the influx, <laughs> um, it's, it's just the southern hemisphere. That's southern right, hemisphere. yeah. If I were to put the, the other plot on here that is the northern hemisphere, it would be out of phase almost pretty closely out of phase with, with all of these rates. Um, but then the slide becomes way too busy. hemisphere <laughs> winter, which is June, July. Mm -hmm. Right in here. Um, clearly, you have a, a large bulge that's that's uh, that's that's sustained by some flux for a long period of time. Right. And and since the other hemisphere is helium poor at that time, whereas the southern hemisphere is helium rich, it must be that the sustenance of that of that that high helium level must be controlled by the vertical. Because you have a long, you have month, several months go, of ongoing downward transport. And so the, the vertical flux must somehow be sustaining that. I, I certainly think it, yeah, it plays a, absolutely, it plays a very strong role. <laughs> There's a dramatic redistribution of the helium. What's the uh, mechanism that's driving that down to the lower latitudes? So that is, um, that's somewhat related to this. Um, uh, let, let me go back there very quickly. Um, so I wish I could freeze it right at the storm, but, um, but basically when you have this heating, you have an, an uh, um, well, you have heating that expands the atmosphere. Um, that causes winds to flow away from the heat. Uh, there's a divergence there, um, and there's a wind um, disturbance wind in, in a way situated away from that. So, so um, basically, helium um, in, in a way. You're, you're upwelling and, you're con and, and you have uh, divergence at the same time. You're both bringing up the more heavy species and you're spreading out 
uh, the light ones up above. And, and so that happens very quickly here. And, and you also have um, um, the disturbance winds will bring with it um, horizontal advective effects as well. Um, so the, the uh, divergence winds and the um, advection term kind of um, work together in this case. <clears throat> Related to the earlier question uh, on the interhemispheric uh, uh, transport, mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if, if it's even possible to, you know, to say uh, if those two are mutually exclusive. Because I was thinking, in the lower atmosphere, say the Bruce Dobson circulation, it is uh, it kind of interhemispheric. You have a circulation cell. Mm -hmm. And that has both a vertical and uh, meridional component uh, uh, to to those. And uh, so I was wondering if it's for the upper atmosphere, if it's also possible to analyze the general kind of flow pattern and see if it's just uh, you know the two different components of the of a one circulation pattern. Right. Yeah, I think that that would be very useful. Um, yeah, I, I would probably I would propose that. Um, yeah, those two are maybe more more intricately connected than um, than than we think. And on this, this uh, part, uh, the, the, during the storms, can you still uh, prescribe a, a consistent, self-consistent kind of uh, flux, vertical flux, during the storm? Yeah, that is a good question, and um, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, and I think it would take um, some more sophisticated. Um, modeling to see what the time scales are um, for these ballistic trajectories because a lot is happening very very quickly here um, so it, the um, upper boundary condition as it is right now is, is a very static picture so um, I'm not sure that's so accurate um, but I don't know how bad of a guess it is okay. no more questions so let's uh uh, Eric again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.